oh, this is not indefinite integrals, improper integrals, improperly written down. So what are improper integrals? Obviously they're integrals or antiderivatives that are not proper, but specifically that can mean one of three things. Your endpoint, you have an endpoint of infinity, you have an endpoint of negative infinity, or you're crossing a vertical asymptote. So those are the three things that can make an integral improper. And our integral will go from a to b fx dx. So first, you could have a equals uh, negative infinity. That's a small value. Now I'm going to write a could be plus or minus infinity because you don't have to have the small value on the bottom. If you have a small value on the bottom, you can always just switch endpoints and put a negative in front. So A won't always be negative infinity. It could be positive infinity. So that's one possibility. The second one, the other endpoint, B, could also be plus or minus infinity. The third way. f of x has one or more vertical asymptotes on the interval from a to b. Now, I don't care if the function has a vertical asymptote somewhere else. If, that we're, if we're integrating across an interval that has no vertical asymptotes, we can just do it normally. But if, the inter if that interval has vertical asymptotes, we need to be careful. Uh, so just because a function has vertical asymptotes, you have to make sure they're inside that interval. So if they're happening outside, it won't affect the integral. And we'll deal with one and two first. They're a little easier. Uh, dealing with the number three is a little bit more tricky. So this is how to deal or how to treat one and two. So we don't actually know how to do antiderivatives or integrals from negative infinity to positive infinity. So one thing we can do, we can go from negative infinity to C fx dx plus c to infinity fx dx. So this is one of the first uh, boundary rules you learned off antiderivatives. You can go from, uh, you can pick any point in between, and actually that point doesn't even need to be between negative infinity and positive infinity. Well, every point's in between those two, but if your c doesn't have to live inside the interval, it can come from somewhere outside your interval. Uh, but the point is, you get to pick the number C. Uh, so you get to choose C, so choose a nice C. Generally, zero is pretty good, one is pretty good. Sometimes you do something like E or pi or something like that, depending on what function you're dealing with. So these are some of the nicest C, uh, values. Zero, I would try to use zero whenever possible. And then other times, it may not be great to use zero. All right, so all we did was turn an integral with two things we didn't know about how to treat into two integrals, but each of them have one thing we didn't know how to treat. 
So we made the problem half as bad. So what we're going to do next is now actually treat that single uh, endpoint right here. So we're going to do something sneaky. So what we're going to do is integrate from A to C, and then after we're done integrating, we'll take a limit. So we know how to integrate, so we're going to do that, and then when we're done, we're going to take a limit, as opposed to trying to just plug in infinity. And of course, we do the same thing on the other end. We don't want to use the same letter, so I'll go B approaches infinity. So you have to split it up if you have both infinities. Then you need to break it into two. If you only have uh, one infinity, you don't need to break it into two pieces. Should be a B be on the top? Yep. Or else I'd have to subtract the two. Here we go C to B. All right, first example. Now, before we get started on any of these, somewhere you should have a voice in your head saying, well, shouldn't this be always infinity if we're going to in integrate across an infinitely wide region? How could you integrate across an infinitely wide region and not have an infinite amount of area? So this function definitely needs to get uh, very close to the x-axis when we're far away from, when we're approaching infinity and negative infinity. So the idea is, if this is going to be finite, at some point we've got to get very, very, very close right here, and we're going to need to get very, very, very close right there. So for example, if we're always one away, and we never get closer than one, I could say that the entire function would be outside this infinitely wide rectangle. So it would have more area than infinity. So we're going to need our function to get small. So what happens when x is really big in our function right here? Our value would be very small. So this one's got a shot. So how do we integrate? I got the steps right here. We're going to split it up. What's a good x value? Are there any vertical asymptotes? It looks like there might be, but if we keep it real, there's no real x values that make that 0. There are two x values that would make it 0 plus or minus i, but we're not going to deal with uh, complex values until differential equations. So for us, this is no vertical uh, asymptote that's happening. So step one, we're going to split it into two pieces. And I'll do that in two steps. We'll keep limits out in the first step. So I think 0 would be a very reasonable choice here. So we'll go minus infinity to 0 plus 0 to positive infinity. And now that we've broken two pieces, we're going to take both of the infinity and negative infinity out and use letters and write limits. And I'll use the same letters I used above. Lim a approach negative infinity. Integral a to 0. So these integrals should look familiar to you. If not, hopefully your cheat sheet knows what they are. I picked it so it would be super easy to integrate. Almost. Yes. 
So these are arctangents. And this is the already u squared, or uh, you don't need a u sub, and your a is 1. So this is the perfect tangent inverse antiderivative. And do not apply your limit until you have no more other calculus to do. And I'm using extra parentheses, so I'm sure that I evaluate the endpoints before I take my limit. So if you take your limit first, you're undoing that whole process of writing the limit. Oh, that's tangent inverse. I said it, and then didn't write it. What is tangent inverse of 0? So let's say you don't remember tangent inverse very well. Hopefully you remember tangent inverse is the inverse of the tangent function. Certainly if you're saying that in your head, you must know that. So tangent inverse eats sides and gives us angles. So I'm going to let theta equal tangent inverse of 0, and then I'm going to bring the tangent function to the other side. You have to be a little careful because this has infinite solutions. I want to pick the right one. What theta value? There's infinite correct theta values, but only one of them makes sense on the previous line here. What theta value? Tangent of 0 is 0. Tangent Sine over cosine, so fractions are 0 and the numerator is 0. Now hopefully you can see 0 works, pi works, 2 pi, 3 pi, etc. Negative pi, negative 2 pi. But we only have one of those values that's going to be in the range of tangent inverse, which is 0. All right, tangent inverse of 0 is 0. And now we're supposed to figure out what is tangent limit, uh, or limit tangent inverse when x goes to positive infinity and negative infinity. So do you remember the graph of tangent inverse? So let's say you don't remember the graph of tangent inverse. Do you remember the graph of tangent? A little bit. Hopefully. So do your best to draw one period of the graph of tangent. So there's one period of the tangent graph. It goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. How do we invert graphs? Turn them sideways. Turn them sideways. So you take your x and y axes, and you're just swapping x and y. You're swapping inputs and outputs. So we're going to redraw the graph. And I'll just go right with blue right on top of this graph. So I'm going to redraw the graph but swapping x and y values. So what were horizontal, uh, vertical asymptotes are going to become horizontal asymptotes. That's y equals pi over 2. And the other one, y equals negative pi over 2. What happens to the origin when you swap x, y coordinates? 
Nothing. Nothing. So zero zero swaps to zero zero. Now any point that has the same x and y value stays where it is. So there'll be one point somewhere along the way that will stay where it is, and another point that stays where it is. Now, depending on your visual uh, spatial skills, we'll look at the top half. What happens when I, and you can line up another line to help you. This is the y equals x line. We're reflecting across this green line. So we're going to do a mirror image across the green line. Uh, you can see that the vertical line reflected to a horizontal line. What about this function? So I want to redraw this function reflected, and it's going to look like that. So that's that mirror image. And something similar happens down here. It's going to look like that. So now I'm going to delete my original tangent. Actually, let me make it dotted instead. So now we have our tangent function here, our tangent inverse function, and that's the blue. So what is the limit when x goes to positive infinity? 5 over 2. So we go, keep going to the right. We're going to get closer and closer to 5 over 2. What about if we keep going to the left? Negative 5 over 2. All right, so those are our two limits that we needed. 5 over 2, negative 5 over 2. And let's see, our positive infinity. We'll do that guy first. That was pi over 2. Our other one was negative pi over 2, but it was negative of that. So negative, negative pi over 2. Pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is pi. Probably not the number you were expecting when you first saw that one set up. I can't scroll out enough to see that, but. You probably wouldn't have been thinking circle. Or not circle, uh, pi, which has something to do with being circular, or at least trigonometric. What does the actual graph look like of 1 over uh, 1 plus x squared? The actual graph is not terribly exciting. It looks something like that. What's the biggest this ever gets? That'll be the smallest the denominator ever is, which is when x is 0, it's 1. And then it's smaller everywhere else. So the graph looks pretty much just like I drew it right there. So it has this little bump in the middle, and then it gets super small when x is really big. All right, so that's our first improper integral. Let's do another example. So we'll do the 1 over x function. And let's go from, I don't want to mess with our vertical asymptote, so let's go from 1 to infinity. So we'll, our asymptote's at x equals 0, so we'll stay clear of that. So we'll go from 1 to infinity. So I want you to write a limit, and then find the, the antiderivative of this is super easy, but then you're going to have to decide, well, what in the world is the limit of that? Which you may need to flip back to the first thing we did in the quarter. And if that's not on your cheat sheet, it probably needs to make it there. It would be helpful if I brought my cheat sheet in this folder. So, yep. Got that. I see a cheat sheet right behind you. If you get to that point, you can probably turn around. This log? Is that one? Okay. Natural log, yeah. yeah. That's the easy part, though.
So the actual antiderivative part of this is the easy part. It's the limit part that's a little tricky. So this is what the anti-power looks like performed correctly. On the only power you're not allowed to perform it on. So if you apply the anti-power rule, this is what you should be looking at, 1 over 0, which should be a very clear indication something's not right. So what is ln of 1? So that's 0. That part's not a tricky part. What about the natural log of a when a gets really big? Anybody have that on their cheat sheet? So this is, I think, way back in 6, 2, no, 7, starting at 7, 7, 2, approximately. We looked at some limits of natural log, and that was infinity right there. So the natural log function basically has a graph that looks like this, and it never stops increasing. Uh, not only that, uh, there is no maximum, whatever y value you're thinking about, uh, even if y not is a very huge value. Uh, so our function is y equals ln x. How do I solve for x here? Inverse log. So that means e to the y naught equals x. So if you think of a huge number like 10 trillion, I'll just input e to the 10 trillion. And I got your y value right there. So whatever huge y value you're thinking of, no problem. There's an input that gets there. Uh, you, it's going to be a huge number. e to the 10 trillion is way, way, way bigger than 10 trillion. And you can see that happening. Even e to the fifth power is way bigger than 5. So that's what they call exponential increase. When we did L'Hopital's rule. You saw that happen in L'Hopital's rule, like e to the x over x to the hundredth. What is this limit? So I could apply L'Hopital's rule 99 times. What will it look like after 99 L'Hopital's? e to the x over 100 factorial. Why 100 factorial? What's the derivative of e to the x to the 100? 100 x to the 99th. What's the derivative of 100 x to the 99th? So keep breaking those out. And factorial just means 100 times 99 times 98. 
So L'Hopital's rule, take a limit of this. This is a very, very, very sloppy application of L'Hopital's rule. But I'm a professional, so I can do this. What is this limit? That's just a number. It's not getting any bigger. E to the infinity, which is infinity. So exponential functions beat any polynomial, or all polynomial functions, no matter what. You would need induction, so you would have to, let's see, I would, um, so you get inf e to the infinity over infinity to the n, you have to make sure n is greater than, um, I'm going to take a derivative, so I I think I need to have n greater than or equal to 2. Um, certainly, you don't want any less than 1, or else uh, your derivative is not going to be a positive power anymore. So it might work when n is greater than 1. So that's infinity over infinity. 